Welcome again, everybody, and thank you for coming. Uh, I, uh, there's always the, the uh, risk when you're dealing with Hegel that you will frighten everybody off after the, the first exposure. They'll run for cover, uh, preferring to save their lives rather than put them through the misery of the dialectic. But the dialectic is your life, actually. So um, you'd be only running from yourself. You know, that's the great entrapment of Hegel. There's no escaping it. You know, there's no escaping it. Uh, today, uh, I want to advance what we were saying. I don't want to do very much. Uh, I, I mean, we're not turning any radical corners because it's part of a whole continuum, as everything in Hegel is, uh, as you're, you're well aware now, uh, or at least you should be. Um, and it's particularly interesting, this, because we are now entering the realm of spirit, what he calls spirit, consciousness, mind, reason. And that's the final phase of the dialectic, you know, um, for reasons that I'll explain momentarily. But uh, in the, the overall title, uh, it was art, religion and history. I will return to history more specifically next week when we're dealing with um, um, politics, uh, that is con the, the conservative politics of the philosophy of right because it pertains more to that than it does today. But I did want to emphasize at the outset that, of, of course, the great, the, the, one of the great innovations of Hegel was to make history uh, central to the philosophical endeavor, uh, and thus to make history central to our lives. You'll notice that in all the subjects that Hegel treats, uh, we are dealing with the history of philosophy, the philosophy of history. The philosophy of religion is a, is, is a history of uh, religious thought, the history of aesthetics, the history of, as I'll explain today, is, is, is how our art unfolds, um, and so on. Uh, and thus, it is also in the philosophy of right. Uh, and this is because the, remember that we are not aiming towards unifying uh, the, or bringing us to a point where the subject, the, the, the mind of the subject or the concepts of the subject come into direct correspondence with the world as it is in itself, if there is such a thing, or what we call reality, because that would bring inquiry to a stop. Okay, that would bring inquiry to a stop where Hegel sees inquiry as unfolding in accordance with the fact that concepts develop over time, that they are fluid and not fixed. I'm just rehearsing what I said in the first lecture, uh, reminding you as it were. Uh, unlike Kant's categories, which are fixed and numbered at 12, Hegel's evolve over time. I think that's pretty self-evident. I mean, an, an awful lot uh, is, is counterintuitive in this, but I think that's pretty self-evident insofar as we change uh, over time and as our minds change, so too does our reality, so-called, so-called uh, the, ex the external world. Uh, the shape of it changes, the feel of it changes, the aspect of it changes, the, uh, the complexion of it changes. Uh, but what is changing is not the world doesn't change of its own accord. What changes is our minds change, our concepts change, our conceptions change. As we move from this very primitive mode of consciousness, which we discovered last week, which we called immediacy uh, at the outset of our existence or at the outset of history. And we progress towards that unified state of consciousness with itself, uh, which is spirit, of course, and which we will discuss in greater detail uh, towards the end of, of uh, today's uh, session. Now, it's, it's important to recognize, therefore, that this is a journey to selfhood. Uh, the American theologian Mark C. Taylor wrote a great book on Hegel and Kierkegaard many years ago called Journeys to Selfhood. And that's what it is. It's a journey to selfhood. Uh, you're not going to be given a philosophical paradigm, uh, which again is static, timeless. It's something that evolves over time. Um, this is not to say and these, again, are preliminary remarks just to get you into the mood again. But the, the, this is not to say that 
Hegel is unlike is like other historicists within the philosophy or within any other area of inquiry, uh, which uh, casually discard previous modes of experience or previous epochs or previous forms of knowledge or forms of consciousness uh, uh, when they no longer satisfy us or our needs or interests or whatever the case might be. Richard Rorty, for example, the American pragmatist, had this concept of irony. Um, where we take this kind of ironic stand in relation to, or this casual stand in relation to our um, needs and interests. Um, and we discard them as they no longer satisfy those needs and interests or those desires. So they're like tools. And if the tool doesn't work anymore, it's discarded. Hegel doesn't see the world like that. For him, every form of consciousness, every form of experience, is gradually moving us ever closer to that domestication of the world, that homecoming, that overcoming of division, separation, estrangement that we experience at the outset. And thus they have to be incorporated, retained as it were, as steps on the, 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 the ladder towards uh, the, the full uh, knowledge of oneself and thus of the world. So we don't discard, it's like an encyclopedic knowledge, uh, which is why, you know, uh, his, his, his work is, one of his works is called the encyclopedia. Um, and, and that's, so, so it's, 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 it's foundational and it moves from those foundations towards its inevitable conclusion. So this is, this is, an, this, this in itself is an amazing, a, a, turn, a turn of events in the history of philosophy, that suddenly now we're not dealing with, you know, this, these static mind versus world models. We're dealing with a, a mind integrated into its world and evolving both together, uh, incorporated one with the other. And not remaining there, but ever moving towards the goal, as I said last week, which is what? Freedom, and a very specific form of freedom it is, and we'll talk a little bit about it today, but much more so next week. And that is the goal of all history for Hegel, uh, is to acquire that sense of self-knowledge where the world becomes uh, one's home, where all divisions, ruptures, otherness, and difference, all things that stand over against us as alien objects become ours where we see ourselves or where consciousness sees itself reflected in these things. Now, the assumption is here, you could, you could very well say that the world is different to us, is external to us at some stage of our experience. Uh, and that in through our in engagement with it, as we described last week, uh, we come to subdue it through consciousness. But that is still to think of a division between consciousness and the world or reality. It's not like that. The world was always already formed through concepts. Remember, consciousness goes all the way down. There's no point at which consciousness stops and reality begins. All these things that we brought in from the first lecture. Therefore, the separation or the division that you perceive between yourself and the world is occurring within consciousness. You perceive the, uh, the, the, the object as being distinct from you, as being alien from you. You perceive the world at the outset of experience from being uh, uh, separated from you. Is you're estranged from it. That's what you perceive. But that is not, it's not as though the world were separate from you and you've yet to apply the concepts. The concepts have already been applied. They predate you. And the whole process of recollection is where we finished off last week, is coming to terms with that. Remember we said that the subject of uh, uh, substance comes or mediates with object of substance through learning, through recognition. 
So the new criterion from moving from one phase of consciousness to another is recognition and freedom. And when consciousness recognizes itself in the world and is at home in the world fully, we will have truth. The union of subject and object. But again, mark it well, that is something that happens within consciousness. The, it's an idea that the world is somehow separate and distinct from the concepts which shape it. That in itself is a concept. It is an idea. The, uh, uh, Michael Inwood, as I, you'll, you'll have read in the, in the, um, uh, in the, in the uh, response that I gave to the fine question by Patrick Roach last week, which we distributed by email, I included a little line from Michael Inwood, uh, the eminent hist Hegel histor uh, philosopher, who says, the very contrast between concepts and external objects is itself a concept or a conceptual construction. Coming to the realization, that realization is self-knowledge, is spirit, is realizing that the whole world is always already spiritualized, full of consciousness, marked by Geist, as it were, marked by consciousness. Now that's important because once we recognize that, then we have progressed far in the dialectic of consciousness or in the journey to selfhood. We now begin to see that the world is not something over distinct and indifferent to us. It is not an other or a holy other that we cannot know and as something that's ever beyond us an eternal beyond, as he calls it in relation to his critique of Kant, Fichte and Schelling. No, everything, everything uh, can be and is a, uh, a concept. Known is something known. You can't say that something is unknown because that once you do, it becomes knowable. It's put under a category of thought. So looking at it that way now, the process is coming to terms with the fact that we are not on one side and the world on another, but that we are, the world is changing as we change, as our minds change, as our concepts change, as our conceptions change. Until such a point as we realize that the objects are not distinct from us, but they are beginning to reflect us. And we just spoke about that at length last week in terms of the phenomenology of spirit. What the phenomenology of spirit does, and that is the history of consciousness actually, uh, in abstract terms, the philosophy of history will do in concrete historical terms. It'll flesh it out as it were for you. What I described very abstractly last week, although I did add flesh to it in terms of personal experience, every person's experience, uh, the philosophy of history will put meat on those bones. But so too will art and religion. And of course, politics, which we'll, return, we'll, we'll, we'll take up next week. Interestingly enough, the final phase of the phenomenology of spirit is art, religion, and philosophy. And that is the sphere of spirit. For we now realize that the world reflects us in everything. There is no area of uh, uh, human experience that is untouched by human concepts. That is not a conception. And we begin to see that the world is self-conscious because when I observe it, it's consciousness observing its conceptions. We've moved beyond the, the idea of a separation between myself, the subject and the object, 
to one where there's now a union of subject and object, that is, where the object becomes a subject, as it were. I recognize myself in it. I see myself reflected in the contours of the world. The world reflects back at me who I am. Consciousness mirrors consciousness. It doesn't mirror nature. Rorty's great book, The Philosophy and the Mirror of Nature. No, it's philosophy and the mirror of consciousness. Consciousness mirroring consciousness. And when it does so, and when you reach that realization, then it is that you're in the realm of spirit. Then it is that you begin the great discovery of one's own freedom and self-recognition. You're free from the bondage and the alienation of thinking that, thinking that, conceptualizing that the world is different to you, the world is other to you, the world and everything in it stands over and above you in terms of the experience as we outlined last week of the child as it were. What pushes them on is the, the, the drive towards the desire for self-recognition. But remember, this is a phenomenology of consciousness. Not a phenomenology of things, not a phenomenology of objects. It's consciousness appearing to consciousness in the world. Which is why these more spiritual activities, art, culture, art, stroke culture, and religion, and philosophy, come at the end, the very end of the dialectic. Where consciousness does realize that, that self-consciousness realizes that consciousness of itself is consciousness of the world, and consciousness of the world is consciousness of itself. It sees itself reflected in the world. In its abbreviated form, this means that the, the, the sphere of art is immaterial, just as religion is immaterial, just as philosophy is immaterial. What I am doing now, well, actually, even more so on, on this platform, is, is thought thinking itself. We, we, there's nothing mediating my thoughts here. I'm not using anything. Uh, I'm not using any matter. I'm merely reflecting. It's thought thinking itself. And that is the, that's the high point of spirit, for a uh, high point of consciousness for uh, Hegel, because everything has been so domesticated that I'm so relaxed in this world. Everywhere I look, I recognize myself, not myself, but the, 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 the spirit, the character of the age, the concepts which I have uh, used or have been given to me or have, uh, I have, I've, I've grasped and uh, I've died to myself, all this stuff that we did last week and in order to recollect, in order to take up, in order to make my own. And so this world is known to me as myself is known to me. But it's that type of activity that's also in involved in the appreciation of artwork. We are not so much concerned with the medium or with the object as we are with what the object does for us or how it, as you know, Paul recurs great um, uh, sentence, the, 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 the um, the symbol gives rise to thought. The symbol gives rise to thought. Likewise in religion. We're not in the, in the, in the field, although we are symbolically, and we'll just break this down more uh, comprehensively in a moment, but likewise in the sphere of religion, we're in the sphere of total self-reflection, albeit in and through another. We recognize ourselves as religious subjects in and through the community of believers, in and through the kingdom of God, in and through whatever it is we worship. But it is, it is ultimately a spiritual endeavor, an endeavor of consciousness, an endeavor of mind, an endeavor of reflection. When we gather at a conference, where, you know, as we'll discuss in our second hour, for example, we won't be, our, our merchandise is not 
the stuff of the earth. Our merchandise is thought, pure thought. Indeed, that's why for Hegel, he's, religion is superseded by philosophy or, or thought, but not that it does away with religion or the religious concept or the religious urge or indeed uh, the religious truth. It's just that for him, philosophy gives greater expression to that. And there is a nuance in that, of course. It doesn't mean that when you sit down to do the history of philosophy or you take a philosophy class that you're somehow praising and worshipping and incorporating, uh, having an experience of God. No, uh, the, the, the refined philosophy that Hegel is talking about has come a long distance from the pure immediacy of consciousness right through. He's not talking about taking up philosophy as a freshman because then you would be at the, at the stage of immediacy again. You know, it takes an awful lot to convince philosophy students that uh, the, there is that that the the idea of an independent world over and above the subject is just that an idea. In fact, it takes an awful lot to convince you. <laughs> I should think, as it has over the last number of weeks, uh, judging by the reaction to the first lecture, which does seem which jolts you out of a kind of a what um, uh, what Kant, in referring to Hume, called a um, a, a dogmatic slumber. Um, was a human for, in reference to Locke. Anyway, it doesn't matter uh, that you were jolted from your dogmatic slumbers. So this is what this is what is happening uh, in, in the, that area of spirit, that area of Geist, where the world has now taken on so has become so conscious of itself, and I become conscious of myself through it that we are moving into the realm of thought where we don't see the world as material as such, where we're dealing with pure consciousness. But the great thing about the aesthetics coming at the end point of the dialectic is that it, it does give you a, a kind of a, a, a very concrete analysis of what's going on in the phenomenology, of what's going on in the, um, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the dialectic of Geist. So, as you might expect, when we reach this phase of art, we start off, as we always start off in the dialectic with Hegel, in that state of immediate consciousness or immediacy. Now, what does that mean? Well, art has a history. It doesn't, it does not, I mean, while it is a pictorial representation of our journey from immediacy to spirit, or our journey to selfhood, it too has a history. It too begins in immediacy and must travel these various phases of consciousness until it becomes fully assured of itself. And this is represented in artworks themselves. In the earliest art, what, and again, it's done in, 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 in modes of consciousness or periods of art or historical periods or historical periods of consciousness, if you like, of artistic consciousness. Uh, the, the, the earliest of those, the most rudimentary, corresponds to symbolic art, symbolic expression. It's the most alienated form of art for, uh, for Hegel. Why is that? Because the, the two, the, the, the dichotomy that he uses now is not subject and object, although it will be towards the end of the aesthetics. It is spiritual content and material form. The whole history of art, the whole history of the dialectic that occurs in art, just as it was in the phenomenology, when we were dealing with pure consciousness, is this dialectic between spiritual content or geist con uh, content or mind content or reason content or consciousness content and material form. So at this pure immediate, we could say it's the most alienated art form, the most, it's the art form, it's the, it's, it's the art of estrangement, let's put it that way. The art of estrangement or the art of alienation the art of homelessness, the art of spiritlessness. There is a 
a greater degree, vastly greater degree of material form over spiritual content. The example being that he gives us a Hindu art, he points out, or the, 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 uh, the, the artistic, the, the poetry of the psalmist, the Hebrew psalmist. In, in Hindu art, uh, there is an emphasis on, again, going back to, if you like, going back to how it occurs in philosophy, the, the, the totally other, something that is totally indistinct, totally unrecognizable, absolutely formless in, the, in, in what Hindu, in the, in the, uh, according to Hegel, in what the Hindu worships. When you try to represent it, it takes on, according to him, these kind of monstrous qualities of animals with various, in various shapes, various, uh, no symmetry, uh, multiple limbs, uh, two heads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That is an attempt to represent the formless in a material uh, construct. But the, 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 in symbolic art, at least at this early stage, the, you just get that, 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 that disjunction between total, between spiritual content and material form. It corrects itself somewhat, let's say, in the pyramids, in, uh, in, in Egyptian art, or the obelisk. where there is kind of a reasoning behind it as such. It kind of takes on more of the spiritual content becomes a little more dominant, little, or a little more expressive as it were, within the material form, but the material form still far outweighs or far surpasses the spiritual content. The gargantuan, enormous constructs that point to the heavens away from us, alienate anybody who stands at their, at, their, at their feet. Again, the art of estrangement. The object is on this side. The object of worship. The object itself is on this side. The subject is on this side. Divided by a chasm that cannot be breached. No recognition. No self-consciousness. I'm not conscious of myself in that. No, it's absolutely other and daunting. The sepulchre of the gods becomes that which alienates me from myself and from my world. In symbolic art. Total alienation. Just as the formative phase of immediate consciousness last week, there was total alienation between the child and the world. But like any other part of the dialectic, uh, the desire for self-recognition pushes it forward. Remember that peoples in antiquity in that time, as reflected in their artworks, were also subjugated. They were in slavery. And even if they weren't, they were in bondage to uh, those who referred to themselves as gods, were seen and perceived as gods, and thus were so abstract and alien from the ordinary human experience of those they governed, that the, the, the individual, and again, we'll see this next week when we return to the philosophy of right, the individual does, has no, cannot recognize him or herself in the ruler. If the ruler is a god, there is no recognition between subject and ruled, or the ruled and ruler, between subject and governor. The desire cannot be fulfilled. Self-recognition and self-consciousness cannot, you cannot see yourself uh, reflected in that. You fear that. And Hegel, Hegel's whole point, his whole dialectical endeavor is to overcome fear for freedom.
we start out fearing the world, seeing it as alien, other, threatening, all of this from last week again, and I'm tying it in for you so that you'll see that it, it, once you get a hang of the, the basic dialectical form, you can, you can see it running through the, all of the works. And the same likewise here. The God or his representation, his symbolic representation in the art of the time alienates the subject both from him from the object, the artistic object, the aesthetic object, and from the, 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 the polity of which he's a part. There is no recognition of yourself in the ruler or in these objects or indeed in one's fellow citizens. It is a structure based on fear or a mode of consciousness based on fear, alienation and estrangement. The center cannot hold and it inevitably gives way to classical art. What we see here is very interesting. In the classical, as you're well aware, at least the, the philosophy students and history students, I suppose, in the classical period, the, it, it's, a, it's a period of uh, he, uh, uh, I won't say humanism, but I will say anthropomorphism. Where the, the human subject suddenly becomes or takes center stage. So you notice now the material form suddenly starts to diminish. And spiritual content begins to increase. And what's more, spiritual content begins to dialectically merge with material form. The statues, the great statues of the gods, for example, take on human form. This is material content, uh, spiritual content being infused with material form. The temples begin to reflect human ideals, civic virtues, philosophical virtues even. The, 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 uh, the, the shape of the cities changes. So that subjects, at least subjects, if not, you know, forgetting slaves, uh, begin to recognize themselves in and through the objective sphere, the objective order. The temples and the buildings do not stand before them as threatening as, or as alien. For now, the gods have been brought down to earth, as it were. Recognition, self-recognition emerges. The world is becoming spiritualized. There is also order and harmony and beauty, which there wasn't in these previous uh, uh, periods where where the the the, the world uh, stood over and above in that threatening way and the heavens beauty could not be contemplated there was no room for beauty there was room for awe where the material form towered above the subject and where spiritual content was at a, at a minimum barely recognizable But now there is kind of a form of symmetry or union between spiritual content and material form. It's as if the world has become virtuous, as it were. It takes on the very mind of the Greeks or the Romans. 
And that's illustrated in how they decorate, how they build, how they worship, and what they worship. They no longer worship an abstract other. And even if they do, it's incarnate in stone. But that is precisely the problem in the end. It's incarnate in stone. It's trapped. There is still this distinction between spiritual content and material form, even if to the eye, it appears that there is a perfect symmetry between the two. For self-consciousness or spirit needs, is, is life, it's, it's, it's vitality. It's not static, it's not inert. It's freedom. And there are still others that are alienated from me or another aspect of life which is alienated from me and through the, the emperor and through the, the gods and so forth and so on, even though they have now more temporal and more uh, incarnate representations. And so the desire for freedom and self-recognition pushes us on, as it did last week. From classical to romantic art. Now, all the while, this history of artistic representation is mirroring the history of consciousness itself. It's mirroring what happened last week in the phenomenology of spirit. What happens in world history. What happens in personal consciousness, I would even say, <clears throat> as I tried to explain last time. And indeed, what happens in politics and religion, as we'll see in a moment. So what you're getting now is a very, this is why, <clears throat> It's always a good idea, excuse me, it's always a good idea to begin by reading the aesthetics, because you get the, you, you, you see how it works out, you see how the dialectic uh, unfolds uh, in a way that you can identify with on a, on a very, uh, in a very tangible way. So it's mirroring what's happening in the dialectic of consciousness as a whole even though it itself is that element, that element it is an element of the, that dialectic uh, and within spirit itself. But nonetheless, it does give you a, a good concrete outline of what's happening uh, at that more philosophical and abstract level. Now in romantic uh, art, the, 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 the opposite to, to symbolic art, what happens now is, as per the dialectic of consciousness, spiritual content outweighs material form for the first time. Spiritual content is now dominant over material form. How so? It is no longer obsessed with artistic creations which represent the division, unconsciously of course, between subject and object, or man and world, or human being and, 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 and its other, or the finite and the infinite, or the phenomenal and the noumenon, whatever way you want to put it. This is an art, a period of art that's at home with the world. This is a period of art where thought starts thinking itself, where self-consciousness recognizes itself in the world. The dramas, the plays, the music, 
are all anthropomorphic. They're all dealing with spiritual substance. It is self-conscious. It is conscious of itself as being the content of its world. It reflects on things like evil, sacrifice, tragedy. The great sacrificial story of redemption and salvation becomes for it a pivot, as it were. It is the art of home. It is the art where the world has decreased in proportion to the size of spirit. This is self-consciousness reflecting on itself, having domesticated and subdued its world. Now the great drama of consciousness is its preoccupation. The great drama of life, the great drama of, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the ultimate, the ultimate questions, the ultimate experiences. But the main point here for Hegel is that material form seems to have vanished, as it were. Consciousness is no longer trapped in this dichotomy of subject and object, internal and external, finite and infinite. It is now free. And the romantics were free. Free from all those constraints. And they recognize themselves totally in the world, totally in their, in, in, in their context. They recognize the world as theirs, as a home. Despite the internal dramas that they, they, they created, dis, despite the conflicts, the inner conflicts that were played out in their poems, their satires, their music, their novels, etc. Of course, there is. Uh, Romantic architecture, too. You say, ah, but there we have a case where there is uh, obviously much more material form than there is spiritual content. But look what happens. For Hegel, the, the most alienated form of, uh, at a certain point anyway, of, of uh, art is, is architecture. Why? Because we're dealing with crass matter and stone. at the earliest phases of consciousness, which have no uh, point of self-recognition for us. For example, again, the, uh, the, in, in symbolic architecture, such as the, the uh, Hindu temples, again, the, 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 the purpose is not to make someone feel at home, it's to make someone feel not at home just as though they are standing on ground they should not be on. They overawe the senses. And the disjunction between subject and object ever, grows ever deeper. The architecture of the Greeks brings that more into proportion, i.e. The, 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 the dialectic between subject uh, and, and object, the dialectic between spiritual and content and material form, material form, crass matter and stone now becomes beautiful stone. What makes it beautiful? The fact that it is becoming conscious of itself. It is taking on a human form. The subject, the object is becoming a subject. Their union is becoming apparent. And the result is beauty. The perfect proportion between spiritual content and material form.
But remember, as long as there is material form, spirit is not at home in the world. Or at least the, a, a seeming, an apparent division between spiritual content and material form within consciousness itself, of course, always the proviso. And so the, the architecture of, of the Romantic period is Gothic. Gothic cathedrals, for example, Gothic churches, Gothic spires. All pointing these, the subject to its true destination, which is to be at home with itself not alienated from God, not alienated from the infinite, not alienated from the other in any way, but totally at home with the other, with the infinite, with all things that seem different or outside of consciousness. We see this again represented in the next art form that Hegel uh, points to, which is sculpture. Of course, there was symbolic sculpture, which again alienated. And then we see the sculpture of the classical period, which becomes anthropomorphic again. Always that diminishing material form and always that enlarging spiritual content, magnifying or representing or copying or mirroring what's going on in the phenomenology of consciousness itself. But by the time we reach the pure romantic arts, that material form that is vanquished. It, it's been subdued, domesticated by spiritual content. And what are the romantic arts? Painting, music, poetry. And it is here that even in art itself, we have reached the realm of pure spirit, pure consciousness. These are self-conscious arts in, the, in, the, in, in that it's consciousness relating to itself and being familiar with itself in and through its other. In painting, yes, there is material form, obviously, but it's infused with spirit. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a glimmer of material form. The border, for example, of the painting is relevant to the spiritual content. Which is why borders, when you take the border off a painting, it becomes something different symbolically. Which is why modern uh, art, as we call it, postmodern art, has no uh, time for borders, frames. It doesn't want borders or frames because it thinks identity cannot be constrained, ought not to be, has never been. That these are artificial constructs, arbitrary constructs. Take away the borders and the other comes back to haunt us. Strange shapes, indistinguishable, indecipherable. So borders matter. And they certainly did for Hegel, as you can see. Certainly. But nonetheless, the point, whole point of painting is not as an end in itself. Although it is an end in itself, it has no other purpose other than itself. But the purpose, the inner purpose, the inner spiritual dynamic is to lead to greater self-awareness. Here we have, when we see people sitting alone in a gallery, sitting before a painting, they are not looking at the canvas. They are looking beyond the canvas. They are looking into the canvas. And they are not looking at nothing. They are looking at themselves. And not themselves as Mr. X looking at Mr. X. They are looking at an enlarged self. Remember what we said last week in the words of Paul Ricoeur, one self as another. They are coming home to themselves through another. This is who I am. 
this is the way the world has been shaped for me with these concepts, with these conceptualization. This is how someone else has perceived and conceived the world. And I am recollecting that. I am becoming part of that. That is becoming part of me. This is who I am. And they walk away from that experience, not with a painting, but with an enlarged sense of self. The world is now more a home than it was before they sat down before that painting, which is why for Hegel, as it was for Roger Scruton, that modern art is an aberration or postmodern art. Because it's bringing us right back to where we started at the beginning of the dialectic, to that form of where they're celebrating homelessness, alienation, division, disjunction, separation, spiritlessness. So what's the point in that? That doesn't make you free in the Hegel sense to be at home in the world. It doesn't give you self-recognition. It gives you alienation. And thus you have social unrest as a result of it. Because once that seeps into the bloodstream, then you have people at war against their own kind. They have war against, they do not recognize themselves as being part of the social context uh, that they are a part of. They don't recognize the laws as theirs or as, or being, or as, as being living entities, as we'll see next week. This is not without its politi political ramifications. But the point is the painting, for at least for Hegel, is that spirit ref recollecting and reflecting on itself, recognizing itself as being who it is not as a mirror, mirror to me, the individual, but being a mirror to the, <clears throat> the form of consciousness and the forms of consciousness which have made me who I am. But there's always more. Look at music, the second of the art forms. It too D has material form, material constructs in, in terms of the, how, it's, how it's manufactured and played. But in and of itself, it is pure spiritual content. And the whole point is that it's an auditory art which engages the soul or the spirit. It speaks to the person. It can be sublime insofar as, or in as much as, it can try to represent the unrepresentable. If there is such a thing, there isn't for Hegel, but it tries to do that. Or it can be beautiful, where it strives for harmony, the harmony of the sound, the harmony, the, the, the symmetry, as we would say in, when we're dealing with shape. But this reflects what Roger himself said about music when he said that it's the nearest that one comes to, to that experience of pure subjectivity. He meant something different, but very much the same, as it were. There is a, there is a, a nuanced difference between what he said and what Hegel says, but it's pretty much the same thing. Where the spiritual content speaks to spiritual content, where mind speaks to mind, spirit speaks to spirit, where self-consciousness becomes one unto itself. Material form is not in the equation. Consciousness, mirroring consciousness. And again, the purpose is not to stop there. It's not a pure uh, narcissistic experience. This is an experience of otherness, identity of the, the union of union and non-union, the identity of identity and non-identity. What we're meeting with, we are dying to ourselves in the experience of music, engaging with, such as we did with the master and slave, such as we did throughout all of the dialectic. In a, the moment of conflict, the labor of death, I called it last week, or the labor of the negative, where we die to the self, we engage in conflict and battle, such as struggling 
to come to terms with this alien consciousness until that consciousness becomes ours. And we come back from the experience, again renewed, augmented, heightened in self-awareness. We've taken another bit of the world into us, into, into ourselves, and that world is a human world. The subject and the object have been unified. It's mind speaking to mind. Consciousness speaking to consciousness. Home, the division between subject and object, gone. With spiritual content, material form. Everything is now becoming clear. The world is singing to the music of the spheres. And finally then poetry, the final phase of art for uh, Hegel. Here we are, in, we have dispensed entirely, of course, at this point with material form, and now spiritual content has taken over. Now we're dealing with pure words, and words which represent concepts, deep concepts. And poetry is alive and active. It can discuss anything. It can encompass any part of life. It can be tragic. It can be comic. It can be mournful. It can be jubilant. It can sing with the spirit, and it can plumb the depths with them too. Poetry is the medium of the soul. Poetry is the vernacular of the spirit. The realm of pure idea. And yet the idea is still full of material form, as it were. It may not be. And at times, it can, you know, we, we, we do have abstract poetry, very abstract poetry. Which is why romantic art gives way to religion. As that second phase of spirit, in that final triad of the phenomenology. In fact, romantic art is, has already entered the sphere of religion, as it were. We had discussed in our discussion last week how, and Roger makes this point himself a lot, that for those who have given up on religion, uh, high culture uh, can be a substitute. It can't really. It can scratch a, a certain itch in that direction, but it can never become religion. And Hegel makes the point very clearly and very well that what religion gives you when it takes us totally out of that realm of, of what he calls picture thinking into this union of infinite and finite is something that high culture can never do for you because it's always in some way immersed in the material world or in that sense of the material world as being different and distinct. The true glory of our humanity for Hegel happens when romantic art gives way, finally collapses in the face of what religion can do for you. And ultimately what philosophy can do for you as a, a kind of more spiritualized religion as it were. For religion itself has a history. And I'm not going to retrace that for you now, but it's pretty much the same history as we've just rehearsed in terms of art. Where there's natural religion to begin with, there's artistic religion, and then there's the religion of spirit. Where we move from worshipping alien things, alien objects, pure nothingness, towards worshipping a human being. And not only a human being, but a human being who becomes one of us. That brings the heavens down to earth in an, incar in an incarnation of heaven and earth. The divinization of humanity and the humanization of divinity. Where the heavens themselves become domesticated. <laughs> 
And the kingdom of God takes place, takes root here on earth. Where, as St. John puts it, uh, as he is, so are we in this world. In taking our place on the cross, we become him and he becomes us. Which is why ultimately Hegel sees the community of love as the kingdom of God. The community, communion, one with. We become one with them. We are unified, totally unified with the infinite. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And in that moment, spirit comes to full self-realization. It needs one more step. And it is a step that we, we, we probably take at the end of next week's session, because one has to finish Hegel at the right, on the right note. But for the time being, it's important to, to realize and to recognize that we are now in a realm of pure consciousness, where alienation is overcome, where we have satisfied ourselves in terms of our need for self-recognition, where we are free, not to do as we will, but to be in the world amongst strangers who are somewhat the same, where there is a union of subject and object, an identity of identity and non-identity, where we are at home. 